So hi everyone, welcome, welcome, welcome. A good morning, good afternoon, good evening to whoever you're watching in the world. I'm super glad to have you here with us on another episode of The Uncast Show. So in today's show, we've got a really interesting guest who runs a cool YouTube channel. In fact, it's one channel that I've watched for many years and it's called Bite My Bits. So you may have watched Jason's content before, but I'm super excited to have him on the show today. He's always got really exciting projects on the go. I can't wait to have a chat to him, find out what he's up to, and ask him a whole bunch of questions all about things like media, servers, PCs, and loads of other techie stuff. Anyway, let's not keep our guests waiting any longer. Let's get on with the show. Okay, Jason. So thank you very much for taking time to see us on your Sunday. We really appreciate it. Um, I'm, in fact, I've been a big fan of yours for many, many years. I started watching your channel before I ever did YouTube, and I've always been a big fan, so it's really great to actually meet you in person. Well, I'm really sorry you had to go through that torture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a very pleasurable torture, I must say. So Thank you. you're in the center of the United States. My geography isn't very good, I'm afraid. Yeah, dead center, dead center. You in the middle of Kansas, the kind of top left, right? Uh, closer to the bottom right of Kansas. I'm in a city called Wichita, or close to a city called Wichita. It's the second largest city in Kansas, which doesn't say much because uh, Kansas is a small town farming haven type of deal. So, but I'm going to ask you that that same thing. Where are you from again? I'm obviously from the UK. Um, I'm from a city in the southwest called Bristol. Um, I, I live on the kind of outskirts of the city, so I'm partly in the countryside, partly near the city. Yeah, that's always the best. You don't get all of the inner city life, but you get some of the city necessities yeah, like water, electricity, and faster internet. Yeah. So I've actually got good internet for the first time in my life. I've got a gig up and a gig down. And Oh, I hate you. I, I Sorry, I, I can't do this happy, interview. I, I hate you. Yeah. <laughs> I have a gig down and I have 35 to 40 up, depending on the day. 35 megabits. The up, the up isn't good. I, I used to have half a gig down and about 30 up. Most ISPs, they don't care about upload. They just say download, download, download. For people like us, especially you with, with your Plex servers, <laughs> yeah. so you, you definitely need some good upload. Well, that and just do it like... Being able to do backups, it takes a while sometimes, um, especially when you have to set throttle limits just so that you don't mess Plex up because you have a lot to upload and you just, you know, it's going to, you know, it's going to take a while and it's only 35 megabytes or megabits per second. So you have to limit your upload speeds to like 15 megabits per second. So, you know, I have a personal reserved place in my heart for everybody like you who has one gig up. <laughs> I just resent you. I used to hate people like me, but now I've joined them. So, yeah, you know, yeah. so I can't anymore. Um, okay. So as you're the Plex master, I asked this question to everyone, but I'm hoping for some really good answers and suggestions from you. What, okay. are, you watching, what are you watching at the moment? Oh, <laughs> well, I'm doing the, the Yellowstone and the Yellowstone prequels. Um, so those are probably my current ones that I'm watching. Um, but realistically, I actually spend a lot of like a majority of my rewatching on uh, various Star Trek episodes. Uh, I usually I usually bounce season to season, um, you know, or series to series. So uh, currently, I'm on Star Trek Enterprise, and I just finished Voyager, and probably right after that, I'll be I'll be back to uh, TNG. So for for me, I don't I don't dedicate a lot of time sitting down and just watching TV. So it's more of a white noise that's going on in the background while I'm doing something. Like I've yeah. actually watched Star Trek like while editing videos. You know, like it's just yeah. Say so same here. I might be taking a computer to apart while having Next Generation on watching that. Getting distracted. Yeah, you know, I think that's why it takes me three times longer to do things than everyone else. But <laughs> it's hard for me to sit still sometimes so i just uh you know i want to i want to watch the episodes and i like star trek but i don't always have the ability to just sit still long enough to thoroughly enjoy it i have to watch movies in two parts usually so if you don't mind i'm going to make an announcement 
Unraid 6.12 RC3 has recently been released. Recently. Um, last week, I think, came out. Okay. But it's now getting closer and closer to being the official stable release. And for those of you who don't know about this, it's a really huge release with a really big new feature. And that's ZFS or ZFS, as we say here in the UK. Mm, yes, I've heard about it. But we've actually got some other new things in Unraid that are really getting overlooked sometimes. It's such a big feature, this ZFS, that the other cool things are not getting so much in the spotlight. Now, one thing that I really like is there's been a really big improvement to the dashboard. For those of you guys who use PFSense out there, if you've been using that, you know on the dashboard we can actually move tiles around left and right, up and down, and make the dashboard how we want. Well, that same functionality, we've got it on Unraid now. Like uh, all of the plug-in tiles individually? Yeah, on, on the dashboard where you've got yeah. the CPU, they yeah. can move left and right, up and down, so you can put them where you want. What about plugins like uh, iTops and uh, disk location? Can you move those separately too? Everything that you can put on the dashboard can be moved. Nice. See, I did not know that. I haven't heard that. All I've all I've been hearing about is ZFS. So that's actually I learned something. That's pretty nice. So it's a little little thing that's quite nice. There's a little padlock in the top right. You click on the little padlock and it goes green. Then you can move the tiles. And you click back on the padlock and it locks the screen. Same for your Docker containers and VMs. Click the padlock and you can move them up and down. I have a test server. I got to update that then. I'm going to have to check that out. That's going to be kind of cool. So obviously I'd really like to talk to you about media servers as you're um, the media server king. What is the size of your media server you've got at the moment? I believe you've got about 500 terabytes. Am I correct? <laughs> the size of Loki, my main server, uh, which is a 48 bay, uh, 48 drive server, uh, it has total usable space of 565 terabytes. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Now that's that number is deceiving because the primary array is only about 394 terabytes. That's the um, primary unread array. All right, um, that, that, that's all, only 300, yeah. That's not yeah. so impressive now. <laughs> yeah, 394 um, is kind of pathetic, yeah. really. It, only a little bit more than my 70. <laughs> oh, you're 70? <laughs> um, that's a pretty good cache drive, though. I mean, it's not <laughs> um, <laughs> No, the rest is a, is a ButterFS pool, uh, secondary pool, you know, because Unraid doesn't have yeah. two. You can't do two arrays yet, so um, I went with a ButterFS, and that's actually assigned to my DVR content. Mm -hmm. uh, because I have about 160, give or take, terabytes worth of DVR files. It's 1.3 million files, and it takes a much faster uh, uh, system to run on than what Unraid does in order to be able to access directories because there's so many files in a directory. So, right. Have you have you had any have you had any problems with that? I saw the video where you um you you said about the ButterFS array. You know, you're quite brave. I think. Is it true what everyone says? Is it is it is it as dangerous as they say? Are you, are you constantly in fear it's going to go down? You know, I I heard a lot about that. I was on the fence and chewing on it a lot to the point where I almost started another unraid system just to go with what I knew was safe. But I just you know I I jumped into it. You know, it's a hundred and sixty eight terabyte butterfs array pool or whatever you want to call it. And I used chat GPT to move around files and sort files by when they were recorded because I use blue iris and it breaks it down by when it's recording. So the reason why I'm telling this whole story is because I used multiple scripts that were initiating rsync commands simultaneously. Um, so they were running parallel to each other, reading and writing files, moving files around, doing all kinds of things. Basically everything that literally probably six or seven people emailed me about said, hey, don't do this kind of stuff. Uh, so I'm moving all these files around and I got everything stored on it. And aside from when you add a drive, it takes like a week and a half to do it. Aside from that, I haven't had any major issues. Once it gets going, the seek time's a little low, but once everything gets going and just kind of chugging along, I haven't had any issues and no, no corrupt data, no slowdowns. I mean, it's, it's been a very pleasant experience. So. 
So how many discs can you actually lose? Is it two par two parity you've got in that system? Yeah, I got a, I got a two parity in that one. Yeah, it's, in, it's interesting hearing someone who's got a battery FS array set up like that. It, it's definitely, I acknowledge it's how stupid it is, but then I also realized that the uh, task at hand of me saving the quantity of DVR files that I have is not actually of any use. And those files, albeit I'm trying to keep them, if they get deleted, it's not that big a deal. I'm just, for the, just because I can, I just want to see if I can have five years of video footage. I mean, no real reason for it. It's just just seeing if I can. Testing the limits of Blue Iris, kind of. So, you know, when you store your um, your video files, do you store them on encrypted drives? So if ever the drives got lost, people couldn't see see all your footage? If your, heart, if your server got stolen, is that something you worry about or you don't really care about that? Don't really care about that. Um, I don't have any uh, cameras inside my house that are in sensitive areas. Um, so... I, I, they're going to be really bored watching me sit and I have a camera in the studio. So that's about the most private, you know, privacy, uh, concerning camera that I have. But usually if I'm in the studio, I got the cameras on me anyway. So, uh, the rest of them are just outside and, and keeping an eye on the front porch. And if someone did break in and steal those, have fun watching the cars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So do you think you may, it may be something you might want to switch to ZFS with um, sometime in the future. Ah, uh, maybe. I, I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to just come out and admit that when it comes to ZFS, I'm definitely less experienced with. Um, but my understanding is that you have to have matching drives, and you can't add on a drive just at will, right? You, c yeah. you can't. Yeah. But so you kind of have to plan it out. So. Uh, I think in the future, I do want to move whenever I can get a bundle of drives, like let's say eight drives in a certain size, and then I can do a Z2 array, and then just set it up like that to where I just have eight drives, and then when I want to do more, I just eight drives, you know, something like that. But not, not immediately, but it'll be a thing at some point. There's a very interesting feature, I think, in Unraid, with ZFS that you don't really see elsewhere is you can actually add a ZFS drive into the main array. So that allows you to obviously expand the array with ZFS disks, or if your array was all ZFS disks, you can actually expand it because it just uses the parity drive on Unraid in exactly the same way for each drive in the Unraid array. That ZFS is basically a single ZFS pool. So you don't get the speed of, of all of the drives working together, but you get the cool features like compression, encryption of data sets. And one thing I really like is you can do ZFS send. Okay, when you say, when you, when you say that you can uh, add a ZFS drive to an array, uh, are you saying like a ZFS file system or like you're, you're creating a ZFS pool and then you can add that to be a drive in your array? You're basically adding a drive that is a pool on its own. Yeah. So if you had, say, four drives in your server already, mm -hmm. you add a fifth drive, that will be a Z pool named disk five. But should the drive fail, you can rebuild it from from the parity of all of the other drives. So you may have some drives that are ButterFS and maybe XFS. You can have a mixture of formats in the array. So you could have all ZFS, you could have all XFS, you could have all ButterFS. But the good thing is, is you get some of the advantages of ZFS with the um, the compression. Like I recently backed up my app data to um, a drive in the array that I formatted as ZFS just this weekend. Mm -hmm. My app data was 200 gigs. When it's backed up to the ZFS drive in the array, it's 123, I believe. So... Wow. You know, it saved a fair bit of space and you can use ZFS send. So I've got now I've got my um my cache drive is is um a Z pool with three one terabyte SSDs in a mirror because I lost all of my data a couple of weeks ago due due to being really stupid and um having those same three drives striped for speed 
because they were SSDs, regular SSDs, I figured that's a bit too slow, really. And I don't want to lose any space. I want it to be as fast as an NVMe, so I'll stripe it. And I didn't have a backup of it that wasn't old, you know, newer than a month. Ra raid zero data. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like living on the edge. But, you know, if I lost it, it's not the end of the world. It's only a home server. It's yeah. not like I've got anyone else's data put my own on it, so. Yeah, I've recently yeah. lost my data, so I know. I I, I saw your video oh. where you, you deleted your cache drive without knowing for a while. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's quite similar to what I did, except I, I found out I found out straight away when Vanessa shouted to me that MB wasn't working. I thought, well, that's weird. I just turned the server on and, ah, okay, there's, there's no cache drive. And I, I clicked on MB and it came up like a new, a new install. I thought, where's all my users gone? I thought, ah, oh, right, yeah, Unraid's weird. rebuilt, rebuilt, <laughs> rebuilt the yeah. data and it's a fresh install. Yeah. That's what was wild with mine is because I separate my Plex SSD. Uh, from my main cache drive, even though the Docker container, I think, has some sort of information kept on the cache drive, all of the major configurations, the main configurations were held on the Plex SSD. So since I don't log in to Unraid every day, especially if I'm in crunch time trying to get stuff done, I'm not in there messing with Dockers. But they were, they were all running. They all recreated a blank Docker image. They all recreated default settings, and some of them were running, some of them weren't. I just didn't realize they are working until a week and a half, some plus later. And I'm like, oh, Plex is still working, but everything else is broke. Yeah. But, you know, luckily you had the Synology snapshots. So that was. Yeah. Um... Yeah. Going back in time, was... snapshots are nice. I definitely have a new appreciation for them since with, with recent events. But, you know, you can actually do snapshotting with both ButterFS and with um, ZFS. I'm not sure if you. I I know that it's possible. I've just never never really set it up. Never messed with it. I know that even with butter butterfs, I think you don't get as many options going through Unraid. But uh, again, I'm not. But just I'm not just sure. ask ChatGPT. You know, yeah. you can trust them honestly. I almost I almost did that actually. I was uh, I asked ChatGPT if it was possible to move the metadata. You know, butterfs got all the metadata. I was like, is it possible to move all that over to an SSD? And uh, it said you can create a new one and host it on the SSD, which would speed up ButterFS seek time, you know. And I was like, how do I move an existing one? Like, ah, oh, yeah, I'll take a shot at it and gave me a command. I'm like, you know, no, I'm not going to do that. I signed up for Bard yesterday, and this morning I got an email through saying my wait has finished. So I started at Bard, and I, I said, can you write me a bash script for something really simple? I can't remember what it was. And he goes, oh, sorry, I don't know how to do coding yet. I thought, ah, oh, okay. <laughs> like, like, come on, really? That's simple. Yeah. <laughs> for if we had anyway. two, at least we could ask one and then get the other one to check it. Say, is this okay? And, you know, maybe so we actually, get, them to, get them actually that, talking to each other and arguing with each other about who's right. <laughs> that's a really good idea, actually. Get, uh, having one AI double check the work of the other. Yeah. <laughs> that's a pretty good idea. What's your opinion on ChatGPT other than it kind of messing up? It's pretty amazing. Um, I I still think it's probably one of the better things that I've probably seen in my lifetime. I mean, it's just it's the it's the new era of what I think is going to be rooted really deep in our you know in human humanity culture. I mean, it's just going to be, it's just a matter of time. So I think being able to see it born, see it kind of evolve, uh, I can see how powerful it is. Up until this problem I had, I was able to create scripts to do things in Unraid, like moving and sorting files and doing and doing things. I just I've been able to do so much more, knowing only just just enough to know what to ask for, you know, and having that kind of ability, I think, is very powerful. And the smarter it gets. And the better it's capable of understanding, I think it's just going to be, it's going to be a game changer for everybody. My only problem is I don't like it, uh, about ChatGPT is that it is extremely confident in everything it says. It'll be like, hey, how do you do this thing in Unraid? Oh, you use this command. Okay, that command didn't work. Well, no, that command doesn't work in Unraid. It's this command. Why would you believe me? Okay. I know. <laughs> I, I don't really understand quite how it works because you can ask it a question about something. Yes. And um, I think I was asking it about an old retro computer. And 
you know, I, I said to it something like, um, tell me about this computer. And it goes, oh, it's got a 32-bit CPU, this, that, and the other. And I said, I thought it only had a 16-bit CPU. And it goes, oh, yeah, sorry about that. You're actually right. And I'm thinking... Yeah, but it's so it's so confident. How do you know that I'm right, but you didn't tell me the first time, if you already yeah. knew? Like, how can you make... I also got it exactly. adding up... I got it adding up, I think... Um, I wanted to add up some energy costs of things and I told it what I wanted it to do. And it was just making the most stupid mistakes. It was, it's maths was just so way off. I was thinking how I even said to it, you're a computer. How can you not do basic math? Like these are numbers. Sorry, sorry about that. I do my best to try and help people. <laughs> I'm just yeah. a chat generated AI. I won't, I won't let it be in charge of air traffic control. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Not yet. But that, that's definitely the challenge that I think right now and what I really would consider myself as not liking is it's just that it's it says something it, that it thinks is right and then it rolls with it. Have you heard that ChatGPT has been banned in Italy? It's been banned? Like just yeah. outright banned? Yeah, outright banned apparently. Um, wow. No, I did not hear that. Have you heard of GDPR before in Europe? Mm -mm. It's a law for data protection you can oh, ask yeah, a company yeah. to get rid of your data yeah. it's because of us in europe you have to click those stupid things that say accept cookies i was going to say you guys are the cookies people <laughs> yeah it's all our fault dang it well they, they've banned it because they say they think it's using people's personal data and it's against the european laws so it's been it's been banned in italy i, I think a few countries been banned in russia china North Korea, big surprise, yeah, um, I and so. I think Italy. So it's a fourth country. Which, um, yeah, I'm not surprised. Yeah. Like, you know, like that's kind of what I'm going back on is that I know that this is going to be a huge part of just you know us as a species. It's going to be a huge part of our lives, and this is we're we're witnessing the birth of it. It's like witnessing the birth of the microchip, and I mean, yeah, there's there's going to be some some you know tripping along the way we're going to hurt ourselves probably but as long as we don't get a singularity and you know skynet takes over i think we'll be okay <laughs> yeah you know i i think that um when companies start using it more and more in the workplace the owners of the ai are going to know all what the companies are doing mm -hmm. so when staff are asking chat gpt hey can you help me with this problem i've got at work we're releasing this new product, X Y Z. Yeah. Well, the owners of the AI will know all about that, and they only have to program it to kind of funnel good ideas through to um, to the relevant places. Yeah, I mean that's definitely that's definitely a possibility. How how long or how much have you used ChatGPT? Like, have you have you messed um, with it? Yeah, too for much? a fair bit. A fair bit. Yeah. Fair bit. So yeah, you've it's... probably recognized patterns in the way it it puts paragraphs together, the way it responds. Like you've kind of recognized mm -hmm. the. Uh, I almost want to say robotic pattern, but it's like it's, yeah. it's like it has a template that you can kind of recognize. So yeah, definitely, it definitely has patterns of how it uses words. Yeah. How it kind of phrases things and speaks. Yeah, exactly. So once you use it for a while, so I, I think that'll be the, kind of the guarantee. Like if you are a boss and you have employees that do something for you, it's almost like a good idea for you as somebody who's hiring somebody to do something for you to be familiar with it because you don't want them to just say, hey, chat GPT, do my homework. Then I can go get paid for it. And then they turn it in. You can almost like look at that and be like, okay, I recognize that speech pattern, you know? So. I, hopefully, when it evolves, it won't be as uh, as basic. But for right now, I can definitely tell a, a, a template in just about everything that it says. So, sorry, I think ChatGPT at the moment it's good to use it, but only use it for a field that you're familiar with. Yeah. So, yeah. Don't, don't go asking about open heart surgery and how you can do it on your friend on the floor while he's having a heart attack because you'll probably kill him. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. You know, it will, it will tell you the totally wrong thing. But if you already know about the subject a little bit, you've got, you know, you can you can recognize when it's saying something wrong and you can say, hang on, I don't think it's that. Are you sure? And it'll go, oh, no, actually, thank you. Yeah, that, 
I mean, and the, the spitting image of that is how I lost data. It's, it's, you know, I, I know just enough code to be able to read it and dissect usually what, you know, certain things mean. And the code that deleted all my data had it right in there. It was dash dash remove old files. And the, it, it had no business being there for what I was asking it. And if I would have actually read it, then that's what, that's why I was like not even mad. It's like, this is my fault because I should have just freaking read the line. But, you know, you have to be able to know enough to at least be able to double check the chance that it's right. You know, like you, you can't, you can't say, Hey, write a, write a story about, you know, the Roman empire in five paragraphs or less. And then it tells you that they flew around with, you know, fairy wings and you turn it in for homework. Like, well, you need to know a little bit about the Romans to know that they didn't have fairy wings. So I don't know, it, it might've been better than the homework I used to hand in when I was young though. <laughs> 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 even even if I put fairy wings, it would probably be better than what I used to say. <laughs> anyway, I'm um, m- moving back on to um kind of media servers and and um and plaques. I've got kind of a few questions I'd like to kind of ask you about that, if um you don't mind. Sure. Transcoding. What do you find the kind of bottleneck is in transcoding? I was looking at one of your recent videos where you're transcoding. 18 streams with the 30 sorry the 13900k so when, the, when you're trans when you're transcoding 18 streams that's just kind of little little windows in, in a web browser to a very small yes resolution yes. I'm, I'm yes assuming. It's, it's local testing it, it's taken out the um you know it's taken out the bottleneck of internet that can be just not reliable at all so and do you do you find if you're trying to transcode lots of streams of the same movie do you have the same movie on different hard drives while you're doing the tests or are you using just the same file and all of them reading off the same file i just wondered you know can you get 18 streams just off the, off the one file all being read at the same time if it's on an ssd or or is there is there like a bottleneck maybe you can only get five off one file you know um, how does that work Actually, when I am testing the, the transcoding, uh, going along that same theme of removing bottlenecks, artificial bottlenecks, um, I usually move that file or the files to an SSD because I, I know that's unrealistic to read from an SSD, but it's also unrealistic to do 18 transcodes that are going to be all on the same hard drive. Um, so the way, the way I look at it is that I run it off of an SSD because it takes the SSD's reading throughput out of the equation. Uh, just like I transcode on my local area network because it takes the internet upload speeds out of the transcoation. Um, because I'm there to test what can the IGPU do on the 12900K or the 13900K, not what can it do up until the hard drives can't read it anymore. Um, and the same thing when, with the transcoding, uh, I transcode to RAM, so it's like, I throw as much RAM as humanly possible at it, 128 gigs, um, even if I only use 32 of it, which was my my maximum that I hit, you know, I have to make sure that I remove all of the variables out of the equation that would be an artificially limited factor, just so I have, to the best of my ability, the most accurate results. So so I guess what you could do is you could actually create a RAM drive and put the movie on a RAM drive. I could, but I, I've never hit the limitation of what an SSD could do. Because the SSDs, out, I mean, when I say SSD, it was on NVMe 2 terabyte Sabrent drive. So um, since I haven't really hit the limitation of that, um, maybe in the future with like 16K files or something, but. Is that your dog, Sorry. is it? <laughs> uh, apparently the cat doing something with the dog. She's got free reign over at my house, but sometimes her and the cat get into it. So, um, are you a fan of H.265? Not yet. I'm not a fan of it. I'm not a fan of it because not every device handles it natively. Uh, direct streaming is not always the option. Uh, it's not as widespread as 264. Um, I, you know, I, as a, personally been able to use it inside my house have the ability to control that obviously i can get the devices that can natively handle 265 without any kind of remuxing but um the support's just not there i think 
Um, and if you're, tr if you're transcoding it, 265 can take a little bit more. At least they used to. The, the newer iGPUs seem to handle it without a problem, but. And I suppose if you've got slower upload speed, if you've got people outside the house and they can't watch the H265, it's just going to hit, hit your server a bit harder. Exactly. So the people I share my server with have a two megabit or a two to four megabit per second upload limitation. Um, so I personally, just on my end, if I know that no matter what they're going to be transcoding, if I know that they have to transcode it, I'd probably just rather take a source file that's a little larger, a little less compressed, and a little easier on the CPU. That way there's less chance of it messing up. There's less chance of it slowing something down. You know, these are all ideas from before I did my most recent upgrade where the, the 12900K just doesn't really matter either way. But um, <laughs> the 12900 iGPU seems to be just a beast overall. So a lot of those viewpoints don't really carry that much weight anymore. Because, because of your video, actually, I have got myself. Oh, nice. And I've got this one to try as well. Okay. I'm not sure which I'll use. The i5 um, 13600K. Yeah. Do or, they? Or the, the 900K. I'm not sure. Does that i5 have the same iGPU, the UHD 7? Yeah, 770, I think it's got. They've both got the 770. So I've never used an iGPU for transcoding. Yeah. I've been using an NVIDIA P2000 for years. Yeah. It's really good. It works well. Yeah, that's great. It's great. It doesn't use a lot of, it doesn't use a lot of electricity. You know, I'm the opposite to you. Most of my transcoding is converting existing H265 into, sorry, H264 into H265 just to save space because most of my media is just watched inside the house. My, my sister down in Cornwall, she, she kind of watches my brother as well down there, but they've got fairly fast internet. And somebody over there has one gig upload. And yeah, I've got one gig upload, so it's like being yeah. on land anyway. So. Yeah. Well, I think that i5 with that iGPU is going to slap your P2000 around like nothing. Yeah. I mean, even that one will. I'm trying to do a build to save as much power as possible. And you, you found that your your um, i9 has saved you a bunch of power. Yeah, I've already... Going from the previous upgrade that I had, um, where I was idling in the 1200 to 1100 range... Um, now I'm idling about 650 and I, st I still haven't taken it out yet, but I need to, uh, I originally was going to put a blue iris virtual machine on Unraid. And then I've since decided against that because I got a thread ripper. So I'm going to mess with that in Proxmox and stuff, but so I need to take that out. So I, I don't use it for anything. I use the, the IGPU for Plex. So, um, once I take that out, I'd imagine I drop maybe hundred, 150 Watts. Yeah, wow, it's a lot of power your 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 old machine used then. So what oh, what yeah. CPU what CPU did the i9 replace? That replaced, I believe that one was the X you know, I swapped it out like three times. It might have been the X299. I have it sitting on a motherboard over there. You know, I'd have to go look. I went through multiple revisions. I swapped it out with a 3900, a Ryzen 3900, a 5950. Um, I moved it around so many times since like, but every single one of them, they didn't have an iGPU in it. So this is the first one I've had with an iGPU in so long to where I can get rid of and get rid of my graphics card finally. So, and you also have to remember, um, I have in my server, I have four power supplies and they all take about 150 Watts to idle. Uh, I, I can unplug all but one of them and I can drop my idling just down to almost nothing but just having those the power supplies powered up for some reason they take about 150 watts and i've only really recently discovered this because i've been hooking them up to um smart uh, home assistant that's been a new rabbit hole <laughs> a very very deep rabbit hole so i plugged all four of my power supplies into an emporia power sensor and then tied those all together in home assistant and i've been like read, or reading how much power it's taking what it idles at all the time i've been able to turn each one off and see what it changes uh it's been a real eye opener just kind of seeing and having those power outlets register and, and read the power and record that power um but also made me realize that having the redundancy of the power supplies is is costing me Money. Well, I would never have thought that power supplies just idle would use so much power. So, you know, three power supplies idling is 450 watts. 
it seems it, it seems like it. Wow. That's what, this is a this is a home assistant thing that I ran into a couple weeks ago, and I was turning them off, and I can turn them off from the app. It's like turn it off, and it's like 140, 150 less. Like nothing changed. All I did was turn that power supply off. I was like turn off another one, another 140, 150 less. I'm like, I know these are old, but that's that's a little that's a little insane for me. Yeah, I can't boot that server with just one, but I can boot it with two. So, you know, there is always that. I've been thinking if this is true and and if it's something that I can play out and verify personally that maybe I don't need four of them running all at the same time. Maybe I just need two of them uh, because that that could be three hundred watts worth of, of heat that I could save, power usage that I could save. Uh, so that that's a distinct possibility. So. I went down a rabbit hole of Home Assistant and I got super addicted to it and I had to put it down because I had other stuff to do and that is a rabbit Separate. hole like you have no idea. Oh, yeah. So, what what are you running Home Assistant on? Are you running it as a VM or on a, on its own machine, Docker? Uh, it's I you know I try to install it on Unraid on a Docker and I, I was running into some weird issues. I put probably five percent effort into getting it to work and so when it didn't work, I'm like yeah whatever. Um, but now I got this Threadripper 3990X with the motherboard. Um, and then I put 64 gigs or, or no, 128 gigs of RAM in it. And now I'm playing with Proxmox because I've never played with Proxmox before. So it's running on a virtual machine on that with, I don't know, I think it only has like 16 cores, like eight gigs of RAM or something. So it's just something to play around with, but it was mm -hmm. way easier to set up, way easier to get going. And it is fast as crap. Um, Home Assistant is a lot better in a VM, in my opinion, than using Docker. Why is that? Um, it's a lot better in a VM because when you go to the installer packages and that kind of thing, you may want to mm -hmm. install MQTT. Mm -hmm. It basically spins up a Docker container inside the VM. Um, I believe that's how kind of Home Assistant works to install the ver oops, to install the various things. But if you've got it in Docker and you've just got the Home Assistant core, then you have to set up another container for like MQTT, another one for mm. like Decons for um the Zigbee. So it's not just like So you don't have one instance. You actually have to have other Docker containers to support. So you'd have to have com companion containers and yeah, that'd be a nightmare. It's just not worth it. I I used to run mine like that for for a while, but um it's just not worth it. So I run mine as a as a VM. You gotta tie them together. That'd be a nightmare. If if you don't mind, I'm going to move on to some user questions now, Jason. Okay. Oh, we have some user questions. We have some user questions. Nice. From Rory is not a cabbage. That's an awesome name. <laughs> and this is for you, Jason. As someone that puts a lot of unscripted and let's be honest, hectic, something went wrong. So I'm going to try and DIY it videos up. Have you ever regretted showing something to so many people? Um... I don't, I, I don't think, I don't think I've actually really regretted it. I don't think so because my, my style is that I jump into things that I don't know because, because I feel like I learn better that way. So, you know, that's kind of my style in videos. It's like, I'm, I'm trying this. I've never done it before. Now it interests me. Let's do it. Oh, screw that up. That, that's what I really like about your videos. Yeah. Like, that's so what, that's, that's what I that's, love about them, you know? Like that's my life, you know? So it's like, I can't really, I can't really be embarrassed by how I live because I'm not, I can't sit down and study, read a book and just, you know, Oh, I know a thing. No, it's, I'm going to go plug this thing into this. And if I see smoke, I'm going to look it up and figure out why and then not do that again. Um, so I like, I personally actually enjoy sharing that methodology with the world, even though. Yeah, I've done some embarrassing things. I think that everybody does embarrassing things and, you know, not everybody is, is uh, brave enough to tell the world about it. So, you know, if I can do something embarrassing, tell the world and still be here the next day, then, you know, I'm okay with that. Yeah. I, I think, you know, that's what, you know, gives your channel so much appeal is you, you do just do things, you show people what you're doing. And it's just really fun to watch because none of us out there, we none of us know everything. 
So we're all we're all the same as you. We all just like to try things and say <laughs> yeah. when when we've got someone to look at, you know, we can learn something and think, okay, I, I, I won't do that bit. <laughs> yeah, like I'm an adult and I'm unsupervised. <laughs> I mean, if you haven't sat back and watched one of my videos with like your, your, your hand like this, like, oh gosh, oh gosh, he's did, oh, he did it. Like, then I haven't succeeded yet. So that's, that's my goal. And I've got a recorded question for you, um, from SpeakPipe. So again, this is for you, Jason. Hey, Jason. Uh, my name's Nathan, long time caller, first time watcher. I know you do a lot of content around Unraid related to Plex. I know you used to have a Plex sponsorship, but my question is, what is your favorite application of Unraid outside of Plex? Is it some kind of file server, a game server, uh, anything like that? Thanks so much uh, for all the great content. I uh, just wanted to say first. Uh, he said application. I'm gonna assume that he means a Docker container and or a plugin. Yeah, I think so. I think conceptually, like the, and the idea of, I think my my favorite set of programs is going to be the R's family, just because the idea, yeah. the concept of it is the, uh, you know, autonomous, just kind of run, set and forget, you know, that sort of thing. So um, that really allows the average person to kind of have their 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 server become alive and actually truly have a purpose while they're they're not tinkering with it. So I think that's my favorite concept of family of programs so, is the R's program. For plugins, I think community applications is uh, probably the single best thing to ever exist on Unraid. Uh, I probably would have never gotten too far into Unraid if I wouldn't have had some kind of an easy system to click and install stuff. So, uh, yeah, those are probably my two plugin, one plugin or one Docker container. Okay, so I have another question here um, from Big Big Spoon. Saying, okay. can we see a shot of both of your Dockers that are active and what are your favorites today and why? So it's a very similar question to the one before. Um, I will bring up my screen of my server and try and share it with you and I'll see what I'm running at the moment. Well, NCB get, um, that's my favorite downloader. I prefer Usenet than using any torrents. A few of the R's running here. I'm an MB fan myself, as opposed to Plex. This container here called Discover, this analyzes data on your on your drives. It mm -hmm. can tell you kind of like the percentage of what files are like movies, photos, that kind of thing. And it can take snapshots of your file system so you can like analyze it. Elasticsearch is for Discover. Uh, this this program here, I'm not sure why it's actually running. This can stream PlayStation 3 ROMs to a PlayStation 3. Containers I really love here is um, TDAR for transcoding my media library into H.265. There's a few Cloudflare tunnels here for things I, w I was running when I had carrier grade NAT on my internet before I got my new internet. Vault Warden, which is Bitwarden, mm -hmm. a YouTube downloader, um, which is useful for downloading YouTube videos, obviously, and my CCTV, I use Shinobi. Well, um, okay, so, uh, you know, I do have, for testing purposes, you know, a few R's running there. Of course, Plex, um, I guess speed test, uh, which I, I like, I like the speed test just to be able to run that locally. And, you know, it takes out again, the variable of just the local area, um, or, or the internet speed. So, um, I got a hard drive temp. I have Firefox I was using for something. There's a few in here, like scrutiny and flux, flare. So like they, they serve a purpose when they need to, but then when I, then they don't need, to be running, I usually turn them off. Um, Duck DNS, Glances is a monitoring tool set for at least what I'm trying to get it to do is in uh, Home Assistant. Um, Unpacker is actually sort of related to some of the R's and some of the download stuff, but that's not running right now. Um, just because I went with alternative 
solutions. Uh, but that's pretty much it besides that and pl uh, Plex and Totally, or Totally, however you want to pronounce it. Um, that's pretty much all I run. I don't even have any active virtual machines on this right now. I just, just Plex and uh, Plex related things. So how, how did you get on with MB when you tried MB? Did, is, you know, is that something you liked? How did you, how did you compare it to Plex in your opinion? What were the pros and cons of each? At the time when I was, when I tested MB, I didn't have my 12900K built out or tested or purchased really. So, um, I wanted to use the iGPU and the only thing I had on that one was the Simply Nuck 10th gen iGPU. So I, I used that Windows installation as a testing ground to test equally both, um, Plex and MB. Honestly, MB felt a lot like Plex. I mean, I, I don't, I don't really have any reason that I would say I would not use MB over Plex. You know, where I'm right now, I've had Plex for so long that I, my only two selling points for still being a, an active Plex user is going to be I've had it for so long. I have a database that stretches back, you know, six, seven years that I've carried over from one install to an, another. Um, it has uh, to tally and it has some integrations and it's just it's a little bit more integrated in a few things like TV apps and stuff for my family. But. For the most part, like, like it's pretty close to the same thing with the exception yeah. of I've recently learned, although I have not confirmed is that MB has a little bit better control over transcoding assignments, uh, to graphics cards. It's a little easier, a lot easier to assign what it gets transcoded where, uh, with support for multiple GPUs. I, I've always used MB and I think basically we all kind of use the thing that we're kind of used to. If you've used Plex for years, moving to something else can just feel awkward. I prefer the interface of MB because it's cleaner. But going back to Plex recently and looking at it, I was kind of quite shocked with all the TV shows and their own shows they're kind of pushing through. Um, to be honest, you know, um, Plex is a great product. But personally, I don't really like that. Is there any way of kind of turning that off at all, um, Jason? Do you have to have that? Can you? Is that something that you have to have if you have Plex there? Here's the thing. Once you're logged in, you have the ability to turn that stuff off. But right. that is the way the path Plex has been going down. They've been transitioning. And I've, I've, I think I've said this in a Jason Bites Back video where I see Plex as an organization, as a company, um, moving towards utilizing a, their subscriber base and building up less in the gray area and more into the like video on demand rental, like actually something that you can offer as a product to a legit company and without any kind of, you know, shadow, like, well, I don't know, you guys are associated with these type of people type of deal. So I think with the Plex arcades, the video on demand, the TVs with ads, you know, these are all moves that move in the direction of let's build ourselves up to be purchased by somebody. Let's legitimize ourselves enough to be purchased by somebody. And it's those interface changes that they have made that has made it confusing for people like the, some of the people I share it with who are just, you know, like my, my aunt, she might just be like, Oh, what is this page? I, 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 your stuff or stuff's here, but it's not, you know, it's like, no, it's just the welcome screen and you have to click sign in. You have to do this. You have to do that. Whereas before, I used to be able to just set, let's say, a shortcut to the Plex sign-in screen. And it would just be like, boom, sign in, good to go. Now it's like, nope, kick back, see all the ads, see all the crap. Then we'll let you log in. Oh, you want to set this? Okay, well, you have to go and undo all that. You have to remove all these extra sources. Uh, I have to instruct my aunt to remove all those extra sources. And I have to declutter it. So that kind of stuff is pushing me away. But since I'm so, so deep, so deeply engraved in, in having the, the Plex watch history, the Plex, you know, just pretty much the whole database I've maintained for so many years, I haven't made the switch yet. But realistically, I think that means that they're, you know, just one, one decision away, whatever it is, 
it would just be like, uh, I, I can go to MB and not look back. So we've spoken a bit about media servers. What media playback client do you use personally? What's your main playback client? Is it Apple TV, Roku, NVIDIA, NVIDIA Shield? Uh, it's kind of embarrassing, but if, I, if I'm actually watching, sitting down and watching something, I'm usually just laying down in the bedroom and on the TV because if I'm actually going to sit down and relax, I'm going to be laying down. It's got a Fire TV in it because I get right. Alexa. So it's yes. like it's hard to it's hard to have two separate devices that I literally want Alexa and then I want to be able to watch TV. So, you know, I use the Fire TV for that. Um, right. And it handles it okay, does it? It handles? Yeah, it works fantastic. I mean, it handles all the files. I mean, um, there's it's it transcodes a little bit more. But, you know, now that I have this uh, 12900 in there, I don't really notice any stuttering or anything. Um, Would you better play back a 4K, a 4K movie on that? I don't think my TV in the bedroom is 4K. Yeah. I only have... Yeah. No, I don't have a 4K TV, actually. I only have a 4K TV in my garage, but I don't watch anything on that. It's got, like, a Roku on it. Yeah, I, I use an NVIDIA Shield. That's my kind of favorite... I, I really do like the NVIDIA Shield. I've done it. I still have them. I had it down here before I cleared everything out, but, um, I just, I haven't, I haven't used it upstairs just mainly because I, I don't want to lose Alexa or have to get another device to have Alexa. Yeah. I like the NVIDIA Shield because of the other functions it has. I use it for gaming. So I use the, um, NVIDIA game streaming to stream games into the bedroom from, from my PC. And I like retro gaming on it. There's a program called Launchbox that I use on it to play all my kind of retro old PS1 and Dreamcast games. Yeah, I respect that. I mean, when it comes down to sheer capability, the, the, the Shield is, you know, probably the most capable media player out there. I mean, it handles so many more formats. It can direct play things without having to remux them and, you know, transcode them. It has such, such high support for audio and surround sound and, different codecs i mean it's the most capable media player out there for the most affordable price okay so i'm going to go back to the questions from the audience because i've got another question here that we haven't answered yet it's actually a question for me okay um from error x41 hashtag rip steve's junk so <laughs> Um, question for Space Invader One: What's your favorite BMB video? <laughs> Rip Steve's jokes. <laughs> um, my favorite video. You probably don't remember it, Jason, but years ago, when I first started YouTube, I'd been watching your vid. I'd been watching your videos for a few years, and in the comments of one of my videos, someone said, "Hey Ed, you've had a shout out on Bite My Bits." And I was, I was like, oh man, really? I've, I've made it. <laughs> and there's the video where, I don't know, you watch one of my videos when you're doing something and you said, Hey, if you want to see how to do this, check out Space Invader One's video. That was a very happy day for me. One of, one of my favorite YouTubers giving me a shout out. I thought, wow. <laughs> nice. I, I gotta be honest. I don't remember the exact video you were talking about, but it's, I've probably referenced your videos more than a few times to get something set up. Um, when I was going through my data loss, I was like trying to set something up on for NordVPN or whatever. And I, I just don't remember it. Like the process of everything, whatever I do, I figure out, I don't remember it. So I looked it up and like I landed on myself and I'm like, no. <laughs> but, There's nothing more frustrating yeah. than that. Like you, you, you do a Google search, you're trying to work something out. And you think, yeah. And then your own video comes up. You think, I already know that. <laughs> yeah. So I look up everything. Like, I just want to make sure that I don't spend three hours f trying to figure something out that somebody like you have, like, made a detailed, um, like, Windows VM, for example, with Windows 10. God, I was watching the crap out of your, your videos to get Windows 10 up and running uh, just so I could battle test Loki with that 12900 running Windows VM. Um, but I mean, I got it working with your videos, you know, I didn't go anywhere with it, but I wasn't even able to, to start it without the help of your videos. So it's like, 
you know, it's always it's always nice having just a technical breakdown, which is why I like making those kind of videos too. But also, I give respect where respect is due, because if if I don't know the exact process step by step, it's one thing. But if I have no idea how to do it, it's like, yeah, this dude's the expert. Probably should go watch him. Yeah, I, I remember when I saw that on there, I was like, Vanessa, Vanessa, come here. Jason from Bite My Bits mentioned me. And she's going, oh, wow, that's awesome. <laughs> she's like, who? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, you know, that recently one of my favorite videos of yours, Threadripper video. <laughs> oh, God. I, the trolling went over so many oh, people's heads. It was so funny. Oh, um, just reading through the comments from, you know, some of the people and like, and total respect to all the people in the comments, but it was really funny when people were going, actually, that's a really good CPU. <laughs> At least I'll have some kind of cooling. Okay, so I don't have DDR1 RAM or whatever it is, but I, I can probably go find some. <laughs> like, people that don't know me, they just don't realize how much of a, a, a daily troll I, I am. And I've, I've even said this to some of my own Discord admins. I'm like, I've realized that, you know, sarcasm has become my primary language and that sometimes I don't even realize how fluent I am in it. You know, like, I'll say, uh, the last time I was like the three, two, one backup. I was like, you know, the, don't forget the three, two, one rule. You need three copies of your data in two separate folders on one hard drive. Right. But I forgot to smirk or, you know, do something and say, no, I'm kidding or anything. I just moved on with it. And then later on, I'm like, Oh God, I never told him that was a joke. So I have to reiterate that. I have to make sure that they know. <laughs> so. Yeah, I, I, I play dumb with the 3900 and so many people are just like, no, it's a bit. Like, so I'm going to move on to the last listener question. And this is from Fury67. And they ask, what is the recommended configuration if you're running Docker containers and VMs in Unraid? Well, I would probably say, depending on your workload, if you're going to be running VMs and Docker containers, you're going to need, I would say, in my opinion, a minimum of an eight core CPU. If you're going to be running VMs, you want to be passing through probably four cores, and then you want four cores for the running of the um, Unraid server. But, you know, depending on what Docker containers you're running, it all depends on the workload that your server's going to do. But I would say for a basic server, an eight core CPU, 16 gigs of RAM, an SSD for the cache, and as much storage as you need. I don't know what your thoughts would be on that, Jason, really. I think that's a, um, I think that's a loaded question with too many variables. Um, mm. I mean, I would agree that the, the basic template you just laid out would be a, a good starting point, but you know, you say VMs, I, I ask what VMs, what, what are you doing with them? Uh, do you say Docker containers? Well, what Dockers? Uh, I'm sorry, what Docker containers, uh, and really what, what is within their realm, you know, of getting, cause I personally can't, it's hard for me to build a server with less than 64 gigs, you know, even when I'm yeah. only doing a couple Docker containers and things like that. Uh, when I assign a VM, it's like, let's put eight or 16 gigs of RAM. Well, if you're only yeah. doing a PF sense thing, then you don't need it. So. I would say based off of, it depends. If you're trying to go absolute cheap as possible, then I would just, you know, really look at, um, whatever you're allocating to your VMs. Make sure that it's actually something that makes sense. Or, yeah, my home assistant has 16 cores. I'm starting to think I don't need 16 cores. You, you, you know, in my opinion, you don't, you know, I'd yeah. say, you, yeah. I would say, you know, two cores would probably be enough. You, you got to remember it will run on a Raspberry Pi. So. I know, I know. I have eight gigs of RAM assigned to it. I've never seen it go over like two, 1.8, yeah. you know? So but if, you, if you've got the resources, it can't hurt there, can it? So. That's my thought. Yeah, I throw more at it. So, you know, it's those variables, you know, that's why I say like, what are you running? You know, really look up what you're running and what it, what it needs. And then just try to base your budget based off of your needs, you know? Yeah. And, you know, it's a really good point about what kind of VMs are you running? Because if you're running a gaming VM, you want to have what I call clean cores for that. So yeah. for my gaming VM, I'll have eight cores passed through out of 16 in my server. But those 
are isolated from the main OS. So is they're only ever used for that VM. But other VMs, if if you had like a like a home assistant VM and other VMs, you could actually share cores. So you could you could have four cores shared between four or five VMs and it would be fine because you can actually kind of overlap the cores with VMs. Yeah, depending on what you're running. Yeah. If latency isn't a problem, then that's fine. So for things like, you know, in my opinion, home assistant, you could have four cores for that and you could share those four cores with another with another VM. Which is absolutely why I think that those there's a lot of variables there that the best the best option there is if you are on a budget, just try to base your budget based off of your needs. You know. Um I don't want to keep you too long, Jason, on your Sunday, but I wonder if I can just talk about one last topic before we before we wrap it up. I'd sure. really like to talk to you about this is what I'm very curious about for my for my own reasons because I've just bought the same CPU as you. Mm-hmm. With the um, i9, have you run any VMs on that at all? Thinking about the performance cores and the economy cores, and you do you get the 12 or the 13? Refresh my memory. Um, I got the 13900K. Gotcha. Um, I guess it doesn't matter too much. So the, the efficiency cores are neat if you have a good balance of performance and efficiency cores. But when I was trying to run something that was somewhat res- resource and intensive, like Blue Iris, where I might want to throw six cores at it, uh, I tried to balance it. I was like, okay, let me throw four cores at it because I was isolating them from Unraid. Let me throw four cores at it, and then let me throw, you know, f- four efficiency cores at it. And the performance difference between just adding another core to a performance versus adding all of the efficiency cores it was just, it was just a matter of stuttering versus not stuttering, stuttering while just doing playback. Mm-hmm. So it's, I, I don't know, if, I don't know. The performance was, I don't know if it was just because it was, it was a VM and it wasn't handling it correctly but I didn't like the way it acted and I didn't yeah. want, I didn't want to based off of the research I found, I, I, I wanted to pin and isolate those cores. I didn't want to run my main server who doesn't always, but is, has been known to need some resources to get things done, especially when decompressing things. Um, I didn't want to always have half of the CPU not available, like no matter yeah, what. I mean, so, I can't throw all the efficiency cores at it. It's going to run like dog crap. You know, I don't want to throw half of my performance cores at it because it's going to make my server not half as good. So, you know, what I'm thinking of doing is just isolating all of the eight performance cores. So Unraid can't use them at all. And then all of the Docker containers will just use the other efficiency cores. Unraid will use that as well. Then I'll just pass through the performance cores to VMs and see how that goes i don't know you know if it doesn't work out i'll be still using my um 5950x for a vm server and that will just be the other one will just be my main server for data and um and mb that kind of thing yeah i i have i definitely haven't kept a database or a research thing on it but just i think what i've noticed so far is that it does seem to fill up or just utilize those performance cores just maxed out and then like a little spills over to efficiency um which has been kind of a downside to me just because the cooling the way my cooling is set up it's just a lot of hot air and it can only dissipate so much so i know it's thermal throttling you know i think what, what, what cooler are you using on the um on that cpu it's an all-in-one. It's a two forty millimeter uh, all-in-one. Um, that's kind of kind of in a really jankety way mounted in there behind. So other you were fans. having problems. You were having problems with one of the cores when you're getting really hot. On my thirteen nine hundred K, I have a core that gets really hot. On the twelve nine hundred K, which is what's in Loki, I have a few of them that get a little hot faster. Do you know why some cores get hotter than others? Like for people for the audience i don't know for sure um, my experience my last experience with what i've been going through with the 13900k this round my last experience is most closely re- related to the 70 uh 940 cpu uh that's the one that i had to delid um use liquid metal i mean the ihs that came on that didn't make great contact the pace that they had inside of it was really crappy paste 
Uh, like it was just designed terrible and I had to delid the entire thing and get a custom mounting bracket to hook directly up to the, to the die in order to get proper cooling for it. Just because of the way the set, that seven series, 70, uh, 7940s were just terrible. Terrible I don't IHSs. think I'd be brave enough to try something like that. I'd be, I'd be a bit scared. Oh God. <laughs> I, I remember that video. That was one of the videos I remember the most. I was sitting there and I was freaking out and it, and it pops and I just, oh, it's like $1,100 right there. You know, <laughs> scared the crap out of me. I was like, man. Um, yeah, that was very stressful. The 13900K is going down the same path for me. No matter what I do, I have a custom water loop. I have two radiators. One's a 480, one's a 360. They're both super thick. I got a bunch of fans. I mean, I have everything I need to make this thing run cool. And I'm still, I'm still TJ Maxx in at 100 degrees and it's only on one core. And the other, the other cores are at 81 to 85. So I've taken it off. I've put it back on. I've got the flattener plate. I've done everything. Uh, the next step is either going to be lapping the CPU, which isn't actually too bad. I'm not, not against that. So for people that don't know what lapping a CPU is, you know, what, what is that, please? Uh, you take a very, very fine grit sandpaper, a wet sanding grit sandpaper. Uh, you put it down on a piece of glass or a mirror, something extremely flat, guaranteed to be flat, like not even a table. You put it down on a piece of glass, you put a little water on there, um, and then you just very gently and as, as uh, straight as you can and as gently as you can run it back and forth while kind of twisting the CPU a little bit to try to keep everything. That, that's This is my method anyways, but just you just run this back and forth and then you stop, you flip it, and then you, you rotate it, and then you just run it back and forth, just very, very barely sanding the top of it. Uh, because the IHS, which is the, the integrated heat spreader, it comes up, goes up over the, the die, and then that's what connects your cooling to it. Well, if it is bent, let's say it's beveled just a little bit, then it's going to have potentially a hot spot, like let's say on the outside. Or if it's embossed a little bit, it's going to have a hot spot in the middle. Or whatever deformity it has, you're going to have a hot spot that thermal paste just won't be able to help. Um, so when you lap it, you just, you flatten that thing out. That way it makes a much more solid connection with your cooler. Is there any way to see on a CPU if you actually need to do that? Cause I'm, I'm assuming it's due to a, a manufacturing default that, you know, they haven't made it quite flat. Is there any way you can actually kind of tell by putting it onto a piece of glass? Does it kind of wobble or something? Or you just, it's just something you can't see with the naked eye. You know, that's kind of the problem is that it's, it's not all CPUs are really going to react that, that aggressively to it. Uh, the reason why the 7940 had an issue and I lapped it before I delitted it is because inside it had an issue, uh, which is why I ended up delitting it, you know. So other CPUs, they have really good internals, like they have really good connection inside. The die to the IHS has a really good connection. So those inconsistencies of the IHS can be rectified by just using thermal paste, right? That thermal paste binds the gap. You know, it works in conjunction with a great connection from the IHS to the die. They're like, hey, everything else here is good. We're just here to step in and carry you that extra mile. You know, yeah, if you want to get that extra performance, you could lap it and save yourself a few degrees, but we're already carrying a lot of weight for you. But my suspicions is, is internally with the 13900, it's kind of like the 7940. It's just, it's not a very good connection inside. So you have two bad things going on. You know, you, you, you have to, you have to take drastic measures. Um, so what that said, what that means is that you can take one CPU, let's say a 10th gen, you can put it on a piece of glass and you can, you know, maybe wiggle the piece of glass and you can see the, the CPU sit there and wobble. And you're like, that's not flat. That's not flat. Shouldn't it do that? Well, then you, you throw it in, you put a little thermal paste on it and it runs like a dream. Take a 13900, put on a piece of glass, wobble it, and it's sitting there wobbling. Maybe the same amount. You throw it in, you put some thermal paste on it. You have one or two cores that are just out of control. Probably has nothing to do with the IHS, the external of the IHS. It probably has something to do with inside. Wow, something I've never done. So 
you know, maybe, maybe I'll be lapping my um, <laughs> my CPU as well now. Yeah, lapping is very stress free. Honestly, it's I mean, as long as you you know don't just get it wet and then immediately throw it in your socket. Like make sure it's dry. You know, you you are using water, so you know just be and careful. How, how do you how do you know sort of how much to do it? Yeah, you know, obviously I, I wouldn't want. Have to you sand ever sanded it, wood? Um, yeah. Yeah. So when you sand wood and you have a a high piece on a wood. Let's say you're sanding it with a block and you're sanding it. You can visually see, hey, I sanded that high spot more than I did the, the surrounding areas. So when you go to lap a CPU and you're just, you're holding it there, you're almost not pushing it down. You're almost just holding it straight, but you're pushing a little bit of pressure and you're going back and forth. You're going to lift it up and you're going to start to see the copper show up through the nickel plating or whatever it is. I think it's nickel plating. So you're going to, you're going to start to see the copper show up and there's little bits and forms. And if you look at it and the way it's flowing, you can kind of see where you can do a little bit more. And this is just personal judgment. You're like, mm, you know what? Now I'm looking at it. Yeah. Let's do that again. Right. And then whenever you go down there and you start sanding it and you pick it up and you're starting to notice the same sand marks, begin to go into the rest of the nickel that's surrounding the what originally started there then you know you're sanding the entire thing so once you're at that point and you're on glass and you're lapping it like once you're sanding the entire thing you're flat but if you put it down for four minutes and you're doing this and you pick it up and you have a big bright copper spot that's like maybe you know right up here not in the middle but kind of in the middle just poking up there you're like, wow, okay, that was a high spot. Or you pick it up and the entire edge, a quarter inch in, is all being sanded, but the inside's not being sanded. You're like, okay, well now I know why it was acting weird. But once you start sanding it and it all kinds of starts to get sanded at the same time, well, at that point you're just flat and you're just, you're just sanding down the IHS. Cool. Um, I'll have to give it a go. <laughs> it's not as scary as you think. Yeah, just yeah. you know, you'll have wet hands and you'll probably get some droplets know, um, on there. If yeah. anyone can break things, I'm pretty good at doing that. So, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> as long as you're willing to risk it, that's all. Uh, it's definitely not as uh, risky as as uh, delitting it. Delitting it is a whole nother beast, and I don't recommend it. But no, I don't. I don't think I'd ever. Yeah, I don't know if I want to go down that route again. I'd never try that, to be honest. I, I've kind of made up my mind a little bit on my build because I'm going to have to take off the water cooling again. I'm going to go ahead and uh, probably lap it and then hook it back up and then, you know, just really focus on the thermal paste and just even spread and just get that as perfect as possible. Um, and if that doesn't fix the problem enough, then I'm just going to go in and individually lower that core down. I'm just going to reduce the voltage, underclock it, whatever. That way the rest of the CPU will be able to ramp up. And I should be able to gain more speed by not having a crutch on that core. Because it's only one core that gives me a problem. So, Well, Jason, anyway, I appreciate we've been on for a long time, longer than, longer than we thought. I just want to say thank you ever so much for your time today. You know, I really appreciate it. No problem. Thanks for having. Thanks to Spencer for uh, getting everything set up between us. Thanks, Spencer. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, Spencer. And it's it's great it's great to have spoken to Jason and met one of my favorite YouTubers and put in in person. So thank thank you very much for your time and um, no. I hope you have a good rest of your day. And I'm looking forward to seeing more videos from you. But before we go, can I just for the people that don't know you, how can they find out about you and where can they get hold of you? Uh, well, my name is Jason. I'm from Bite My Bits. You can find me on YouTube by typing in Bite My Bits. Right. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, byte as in the computer byte, B-Y-T-E, and then bits. So uh, I, I guess the best way to describe myself is a Plex enthusiast with a side hustle of computers and servers. And I have a sh very short attention span. So if I start reviewing vacuums or power stations, then don't be too surprised. <laughs> Well, thank you ever so much, and I, I really, I really appreciate your time. <laughs>